Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Desiree Bryant, RPA's Director of Meetings. We're excited to have Dr. Rossi, as she's known among her colleagues, joining us today from Bronx, New York, to present our webinar, Addressing Kidney Patients' Clinical Needs During COVID-19. Before I turn things over to our moderator, Dr. Singer, I have a few housekeeping notes. All lines will be muted during the webinar. We encourage you to ask questions via the Q&A box at the top of your screen. You'll also notice a few emojis, and that way you can let us know if there's something you hear in the presentation you agree with or disagree with, or just let us know what you're thinking. So to practice, if you see the Q&A box at the top of your screen, give me a thumbs up. Excellent. Great. So remember, please put your questions in the Q&A box at the top of your screen and not to use the chat box because if you put them in the chat box, they may not be captured or answered during the Q&A. This webinar is a CME webinar. After the webinar, you will receive instructions emailed to you on how to claim your credit. You will also receive a link immediately after this webinar to an evaluation. Please take a moment to complete it. It will help us plan future webinars. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be located on the RPA website and the education section and in the RPA eLearning portal. And if you haven't visited RPA's eLearning portal, please do so. There's a lot of great content there. Thank you for your attention. And now Dr. Singer will join us to introduce our presenter. Dr. Singer. Thank you, Desiree. Dr. Arasi Nana Sekaran graduated from Madras Medical College. She is the Nephrology Division Chief and Medical Director of the Hemodialysis Unit at Lincoln Medical Center in the Bronx, New York City. She is also an Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine at Whale Medical College at, with Cornell University in New York. She is a Fellow of the American College of Physicians and the American Society of Nephrology. She has received numerous honors and awards for her work in nephrology. Dr. Arasi has been on the front lines caring for patients with COVID-19 in one of the hardest hit areas in the United States. We are excited to have her here to share with us her experience and what she has learned in the hopes that something you hear today will help you in your practice as you care for patients during this pandemic. Please welcome Dr. Arasi. Thank you, Dr. Singer. Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are. Once again, I I'd like to thank Dr. Singer for inviting me to share our experiences. I would like to thank Dr. John Wagner also, Chair of Nephrology Council at Health and Hospital, for making this event to happen. Desiree, I'd like to thank you for coordinating the event. Soon after the declaration of the pandemic, New York City became the epicenter and more than 50% of cases from New York literally are coming from New York City in relation to both infections as well as the death. New York City has five boroughs, as is depicted here, in all categories, Bronx is the one outnumbering in reference to infection rate, hospitalization rate, as well as the death rate. COVID-19 has been disproportionately affecting, even among the minority, Latinos and African Americans are hard hit, again, in all of those categories. Mode of transmission, briefly talk about primary mode being droplet and contact either by direct or indirect means. In the beginning of the pandemic, asymptomatic route of transmission was not contemplated. However, now all the studies are proven a significant number as high as 40 to 45% of infections can be transmitted from the asymptomatic individuals. It affects multiple systems, not just kidney alone. So pulmonary was the primary culprit in the beginning, we are all prepared but something we never thought of were the kidneys, and cardiac involvement is also quite significant. No system is spared, as you can see from the slide. 
In terms of the kidneys, AKA is the most common complication encountered, primarily in the setting of critically ill patients from ARDS and septic shock. Other than that, some glomerular involvement has been noted, proteinuria and hematuria being the most common presentation. However, rapid worsening of the kidney functions with collapsing glomerulopathy and even crescentic glomerular nephritis has been described. And especially renal transplant rejection, even in our hospitals, even though we don't perform the transplant, we did receive quite a few admissions, unfortunately, needing dialysis. Other disorders, especially outcome in the future, should be known the magnitude, relentlessly progressing to ESRD. Hyperkalemia is more prevalent in COVID compared to the general renal population. And sodium disorders, including hypernatremia and hyponatremia, but most commonly hypernatremia in the ventilator setting. The challenges as nephrologists we face, primarily in three areas in the clinic, in the outpatient dialysis unit, and from the inpatient consultation service. SHAPE-UP is the acronym we used in 2006. We, I published this just an easy way of remembering for the comprehensive care of the CKD management addressing all components. Telemedicine versus telehealth. Telemedicine refers specifically to the clinical services, while telehealth refers to both clinical and non-clinical services. It dates back to the first half of the 20th century, Predominantly synchronous is the one directly involving by either audio or video means, whereas asynchronous can be through the patient portal by messaging or transmitting the images through the radiologist, or you collect the data, you know, and then interpret later critical values, calling back, etc. Telenephrology, mostly the experiences are coming from. VA system in the Bronx actually had published a lot of articles on this. And telenephrology has been existing for quite some time because 20% of U.S. population lives in rural areas, and about more than one-third of veterans are living in rural areas. There's a mismatch between the supply and the demand for the nephrologist and the patients with a severe kidney disease. Even fellowship programs tend to be located primarily in the urban locale, so where easily patients can access. So this London also had done a huge study, so both concur. Based on the telenephrology visits, 80% of the in-person visits can be reduced by this means. And they have even proven beyond the point saying there is nobody involved needing emergent dialysis by this methodology. And 68% of the patients were started hemodialysis via AV fistula and even home dialysis by enrolling in peritoneal dialysis and including one preemptive transplant, which is amazing. So the most important benefit being it improved the access to the patient care. And we don't need to worry about the transportation issue driving far in people living in remote areas. An e-consult service has really enhanced the service by effectively communicating between the PCP and the nephrologist. And by improving access, they are able to follow the specialist recommendations in a timely manner with the electronic medical record. Similarly, nephrologists also can visualize what goes on with the PCP's office. And it improved the no-shows and improved wait time. And it's a primary mode in managing for home dialysis including even in the inpatient during the COVID, we managed remotely to minimize the exposure. We didn't walk to the patient's room. So we were able to answer the consults and manage the dialectic management. The drawbacks have been primarily blamed upon technological services, but however, in our experience, even in South Bronx, more than 80% of our patients have smartphones, so which was not a major barrier. We had audio visits only to begin with in March, now we have the facility to do the video conferences. We closed even our services during the crisis for a period of six weeks due to staffing shortage and to minimize the exposure and with the inpatient crisis. During this period, we managed primarily through electronic communication, e-consoles, 
and involving the nurses, we call notify them for critical lab values and management from the patients needing prescriptions we manage electronically. Lab services were never closed during this period. So the poll now, telehealth improves access for healthcare. Is it true or false? Wow, so 100% had answered the correct answer. So this is great. So telehealth is the way to go for the future. Hyperkalemia, briefly to touch upon, we know that CKD and ESRD patients are more vulnerable. And in the hospitalization setup, it has been described anywhere from 1% to 10%. And with the COVID population, 5% had encountered this problem. Main problems besides the CKD and ESRD are heart failure. Studies have been done in this group. And of course, diabetic. These are the two categories utilize the ACE inhibitors and ARBs, which is well known to be causing hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia increased morbidity and mortality and is a significant economic burden. This is not surprising with the linearly correlating with the level of the CKD stage and GFR. Besides the traditional dietary management, newly we had to focus on with the metabolic acidosis being focused in CKD. Sodium bicarbonate will be helpful to some extent. Similarly, in the volume expanded state, loop diuretics will be helpful. In terms of sodium polystyrene sulfonate, the longest existing hyperkalemia management mode, properly not done in the terms of prospective or randomized trial for a chronic hyperkalemia management. One should keep in mind about the risk of colonic necrosis. We should be aware of that. So in 2015, FDA approved patiromer. Again, none of these new novel drugs, including sodium zirconium cyclosilicate, are intended for acute hyperkalemia management. However, in conjunction with the therapy, we can initiate to remove the potassium load from the body. Patiromer onset of action is about seven hours, and sodium zirconium cyclosilicate within about an hour. And most recently in April, it has been approved for even chronic hemodialysis patients. One note from here is the dose has to be given only on non-dialysis days. Moving on to anemia. Ever since the guidelines for initiation and stopping the ESA in a CKD population with the cutoff of hemoglobin being 10, the utilization of the ESA has gone down drastically. However, iron has a playing a role. Rather than the oral iron, parent iron should be reserved, obviously, for people who are having low transferrin saturation and or low ferritin. We utilize our infusion center to manage, which helps to improve the hemoglobin. And we educate the patients about the black box warning. We distribute the brochures in the appropriate language, let the patients make the decision. And during the COVID-19, we didn't encounter much of a problem as the labs were never closed. We are able to monitor and send the prescriptions. Coming to the dialysis, the best way we are able to manage successfully, because this is one of the parameters we are being judged upon, to score. Target hemoglobin being 10 to 11, we decided to do weekly monitoring for many years. So this way, we do not want to wait for two weeks or four weeks to determine the dose, even though the dose adjustment cannot happen so frequently. Definitely, this one assisted us to improve. The most critical is our electronic record. We integrated a note, lab data into our note, whether weekly or monthly, 
or plan of care where we have to talk about hemoglobin is at goal or not, and if not, we have to address what kind of actions were taken. So with that way, there is no lag of time in implementing either starting or adjusting the dose for ESA and for iron. And we address also in the QI meeting, and holding parameters of the EMR allows the nurses to manage based on this. RRT choices coming to during the pandemic, renal transplant being the best modality, but this was suspended because of uncertainty regarding the impact on the solid organ. In addition with the asymptomatic donor possibly or recipients, what will be the consequences? And due to induction therapy and immunosuppressive treatment, basically cadaver source has been gone down tremendously. However, life-saving transplantation could be performed. And moving on to home dialysis, use of telehealth to monitor is a big bonus for home dialysis. So patients can switch the modalities this way to minimize the exposure. People were very, very scared of dying of COVID. So this is one way of enhancing the home dialysis. The drawbacks in the beginning were we cannot create AV fistula or any kind of AV axis or even peritoneal catheterization. However, later on, once it was declared as an essential intervention, our vascular surgeons were able to create the AV axis. We do not have the experience, unfortunately, with the peritoneal dialysis, but clearly that may increase the number of home dialysis and thus may be saving the lives. Moving on to the outpatient hemodialysis unit, ours is a small unit, hospital-based unit, a station operating four shifts, it's serving 100% minority population, primarily RN driven, and the most important is they cross-cover inpatient and outpatient on a daily basis, not a fixed rotation for a month or so, not dedicated staff. And we do not have any heavy patient, but we did have, a, you know, from the beginning, in case of anticipation, we had a single isolation room, which is never utilized for hepatitis B. Screening question as usual. The most important is we educated staff primarily through the huddles. Patients were educated by posting the posters or distributing the brochures. Being a hospital-based unit, we had a command center which is activated. Any issues, we communicate to them so the issues could be resolved promptly. Person the investigation, we put them in a single isolation room with a closed door, which has its own bathroom as well. However, in the anticipation, in case more than one PUI, we plan to dedicate some station at the end of the unit for cohorting purposes. But keep in mind, no cohorting of PUI and positive cases together, and visitors were prohibited. Novel way we thought about when we encountered quite a few positive patients coming, how to manage adjacent to the unit is a three-bedded acute unit with a separate door entry. We converted that for the positive patients. So with the three bed, we put them on. With the different shifts, we operate them. And positive patients are not allowed, to, in, allowed in the regular waiting area. Due to the separate door entrance, they have the privilege of entering directly. And we also adjusted our dialysis schedule either twice a week with increased treatment time or three times a week with a decreased hemodialysis time. But we chose the patients carefully based on the performance of KTV and their pattern of interdialytic weight gain and tendency for hyperkalemia. In addition, we transferred also quite a few COVID patients, positive as well as negative, to dialysis facilities in the community due to our severe shortage of the nursing staff. And nephrologists also, three out of the four nephrologists got affected by COVID, so which even exaggerated the problem. We implemented some expanded infection control measures. This is very important individual transportation. No group transportation is allowed primarily by the means of taxi and selected cases like ambulance. And we started screening asymptomatic patients, which was not recommended then. However, we decided to perform on all the patients to find out how we can contain based on the results. And we expanded the PPE coverage. Again, this is not mandated, 
All our nursing staff were concerned from the beginning just utilizing surgical masks. So they were using N95 with a face shield and disposable gowns. But what we expanded were disposable caps, disposable scrubs, leg coverings, and booties. That really on their own, our staff did a great job in doing adhering to this. We also decided there are two strategies to discontinue isolation, symptom-based or test-based. We chose the best way of doing is test-based strategy. And at least 24 hours apart, we had to perform two nasopharyngeal swabs. And both were negative, then we discontinued the isolation. Until then, they continued to receive the dialysis in the acute area. And patients who were transferred upon return, we mandated them to undergo the same type of screening before we enrolled them into our unit back. And most importantly, the COVID negative patients whom we transferred outside, we wanted them to undergo at least a single testing to exclude any newly occurred infection since they left our unit. Question, asymptomatic infection rate may be as high as 40 to 45%. Thank you, audience. 92% got it right. I just want to make sure that asymptomatic was not contemplated in the beginning of the pandemic, but definitely it plays a role now. So we should be aware of this. Our outcome, we had a prevalence rate of 42.6% determined by both the nasopharyngeal swab as well as the antibody testing we offer to all of our patients. And asymptomatic infection in line with the reported literature, 42.3% were asymptomatic in our unit, and 50% were hospitalized with the average length of stay being 8.4 days. And ventilator and vasopressor requirement in our outpatients were 11.5%, and one patient required a temporary CRRT and reverted back to the intermittent dialysis. And mortality, despite all of this, only one patient death accounting for 3.8% mortality. With a study done with a zero prevalence study, including healthcare providers, we did it in May. Our hospital got an IRB approval to do the study on 500 healthcare workers, and part of them is based on our dialysis staff also. New York City offered to all healthcare providers to undergo the test. Our prevalence rate based on that, zero prevalence is 18.8%, and symptomatic infection in most of them five individuals. Out of the total six healthcare providers in our center, five of them were symptomatic and three of them were physicians, us. And surprisingly and remarkably, none of the RNs who spent three hours minimum at bedside on one-on-one -on -one basis spent their time because we didn't have the video monitoring and the doors were such that no glass doors is very remarkable. And one RN came down with asymptomatic, just detected by the antibody testing. And our dialysis technicians used to take the machines into the patient's room, set it up, and bring it back. None of them were infected either. Moving on to AKI incidents. In US, in the beginning, based on Seattle, 19% in the ICU setting. However, in our neighborhood, it ranged in New York from 36.6 to 56.9% overall. But in the ICU setting, not surprisingly, it even higher, 61 to as high as 76%. This study was published recently from Montefiore, which is also located in Bronx. They compared during the COVID period between COVID positive and COVID negative patients, aka pattern. As you can see from here, 
ओवरऑल इंसिडेंस एके स्टेज थ्री नीड फॉर आर आर टी नीडिंग आई सी यू एडमिशन एंड इन हॉस्पिटल डेथ वे हायर देन द नेगेटिव पेशेंट्स एंड रीनल रिकवरी इज फॉर लेस कंपेर्ड टू द कोविड नेगेटिव पेशेंट्स दिस इज लिंकन हॉस्पिटल एक्सपीरियंस this is the overall incidence this is the, by the stages as you can see this is a mirror image of what's happening here predominantly coming from aki stage 3 in terms of positivity rate especially on the ventilator and when you have the combination of the aki and ventilator the mortality clearly close to 80% and overall is 80% especially with ards 65% of the ventilator patients with aki had ards and for the inpatient side vasopressor requirement in aki was 48% when you compared with the overall population of 30% and as i mentioned about ards 65% versus 48% overall and rrt was required in 20% in stage 3 but 45% in the icu setting versus overall in the entire admissions both floors and icu together accounted for 10% of those rrt we offered 68.5% is in the mode of intermittent hemodialysis and crrt in 31.5% poll now aki increases mortality many fold true or false Okay, so 85% chose the correct answer. Even non-COVID, AKA increases mortality. However, in COVID-19 patients, clearly it multiplies the mortality. So this is our hospital experience. This is the overall total mortality, and if the AKI, it has increased. and if a combination with a ventilator status is 80% in a non ventilator is lower same aki group if you compare to non aki that's even lower so clearly the mortality is increased in aki group so what are the rrt options we chose crrt there are theoretical advantages being especially in a hemodynamic instability no doubt about that however based on the you know diffusion model convection or a combination mode but mostly talked about is removal of the inflammatory cytokines which play a significant role in covid-19 even pre covid preferred modality for ards and sepsis of course implementation depends on the individual hospital with the facility to do so and the manpower and the capable of the icu nurses to do it china study recently had shown that compared to crrt versus non crrt group the mortality has decreased in crrt however other literature supports equivalent performance with other than crrt primarily sled sustained low efficiency dialysis have shown equivalent outcome which is not a major burden to the staff with a prolonged treatment but not around the clock 24 hours and crrt minimizes the nursing staff exposure compared to the intermittent hemodialysis during the pandemic normal practices may not be able to be applied so the dialysate flow rate and the dose need to be reduced with the treatment time need to be reduced Speaking about intermittent dialysis, it is primarily reserved for hemodynamically stable patients. An urgent start PD is an option depending on where you are. Even though we didn't do in our hospital, I just want to point out few. 
is not the first choice to begin with, but definitely it is, has to be an option depending on if others cannot be done, or due to staffing demand, equipment demand, whatever may be the reason, this should be considered in the other options. Typically done by general surgeon or interventional radiologist. However, issue with the personnel and resources and comfort level of the staff will dictate also this modality. It could be challenging in patients requiring ventilator support, especially with the prone ventilation, but it's been successfully reported even in those they were able to perform peritoneal dialysis. One should be aware of the mechanical complications, especially peritoneal leak and peritonitis. And typically, you have to wait for 24 to 48 hours after the catheter insertion. And then you use low dwell volume to begin with and a shorter dwell time. Moving on to PERT, prolonged intermittent renal replacement therapy is the primary mode during the pandemic to be utilized. It can be used when this is not possible, and it's definitely a hybrid treatment modality. We can run for six to 10 hours intermittently. And as we spoke about the sled, it could be performed on a regular machine. You don't need to be looking for a special equipment for CRRT. And we can use the same dialyzer, high flux dialysis, with a low blood flow rate and a dialysate flow rate. In addition, one RN can do more than one patient in the ICU setting by splitting. And the recommended dose, we already addressed it by decreasing the treatment dose. Top modality I want to briefly talk about. If you, equipment availability is not an issue, a person with a significant volume overload can be managed round the clock with scuff because this does not utilize any of the supplies you needed for the dialysis, et cetera. So if somebody has which you have come across, like 40, 50 pounds on board, we ran continuously scuff with the intermittent if you need to switch it into the modality to manage the fluid overload. In ARD, a setting especially is critical. And I want to mention about Tableau machine. This is something new and few centers already started using them. We are one of them lucky to receive from the CMS based on, from the Human and Health Services Department purchased 50 Tableau machines and they deployed 30 machines to New York to six centers, and we are one of them to receive five equipment from them. The advantage of that is any modality can be used but the restriction being you cannot run 24 hours continuous. After 12 hours, you have to interrupt and change the cartridge. Beyond that, you can use for AKA patients, end-stage renal disease patients, in the ICU, or emergency room. We had an emergency room with a dialysis room, but which was not operational. Any, we tried for a couple of years, could not work out, but as a tableau, it put into effect. Or even in non-ICU locations, this could be used. And we use for different purposes. We use for sled, we use for the sequentially dialysis first and then ultrafiltration or solely for the scuff purpose or for the intermittent dialysis. And the most advantage, you don't need to purchase any special type of fluids because same supplies as the dialysate, as the regular dialysis, same dialyzer. You don't need to you know, buy a special filter is just our own high flux dialysis are good enough. And again, inpatient side, we decrease the treatment time and the frequency as dictated by the clinical status. We decrease the CRRT duration to 10 hours. Pharmacy, we never had the situation to ask them, but we alerted them in the case of running out of supply, they should be at least preparing manually. And video monitoring is recommended. Unfortunately, we didn't have that. And the recommendation is, if you are having a PUI, if nothing emergent, wait until the result comes back from the testing, if possible. And conservative therapy should be attempted. Avoid aggressive fluid replacement, especially with the ARDS. People have to be careful not to bombard with the liters and liters of volume repletion. And in the type of the fluid should be isotonic crystalloid instead of a normal saline. Individuals with the residual renal function, we can give the intensive loop diuretic therapy. 
and K binders and diuretics for management of hyperkalemia. And in the context of severe metabolic acidosis, sodium bicarbonate will assist to some extent, at least to postpone the initiation of therapy. The challenges and mitigating measures. Problem is, we need of ICU beds. We had 34 beds to begin with, but remarkably, we expanded to 195 ICU beds during the crisis, that much in need of our patients. As you see from Bronx, highest infection, ventilation, and death rates, so they're utilizing ICU beds. Ineffective utilization of resources happened in the beginning because of transporting the patient uh, from dialysis room to non-dialysis room because we had the capability only for 30 dialysis rooms in the hospital in the past. However, then during the crisis, they came with a way of connecting under the sink by retrofitting the host connector. We increased our ability to 107 dialysis rooms, so this way to meet the demand of the ICU caseloads. Staffing shortage we encountered, so we transferred our outpatients to meet the demand. And as I said, we shortened the dialysis. They were able to recruit successfully the ICU staff, but not for the dialysis. Much later part of the pandemic, we were able to find one travel dialysis nurse. We could not get help any from the outside nephrologist. Even though three of them were credentialed, but they backed out in the last minute. So we had sequentially one physician only, then two, then three, then became 100% capacity when they returned from illness. An equipment shortage we faced, so we purchased three regular Fresenius machines and three portable autos, and we had also repaired machines that were non-functional, we fixed them. And H, and H has purchased additional CRRT machines, and as I mentioned, Tableau machines were deployed. And the supply shortage, to avoid that, we cut down the CRRT time, and then, of course, utilized Tableau. This came into the later part of April, not earlier. So li literally from May, we started using them. One thing we ran out, which is a really important in the AKI setting, we ran out of the temporary dialysis catheters, but our staff were very creative. The resident, surgical resident, thought about putting the tunneled catheter, Permacath, as a non-tunneled, which worked fine in our patients. So we found a way to solve the issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Arasi. Uh, that was a very uh, thorough presentation, and it's really uh, incredible what challenges that you faced and what innovations you uh, implemented to try and overcome that. Uh, we're now going to open it up to questions. So far, there is only one question, but I'm sure we'll have some more. The first question is from Dr. Cheng, and it's, how often do you screen asymptomatic patients and asymptomatic staff? Okay. At this moment, we did only once to begin with, and not after, except for the staffing, we only did as a part of the study. Only for the patients, we did the screening. Our suggestion would be similar to nursing home setting where they encounter the breakout. We prefer weekly, but we are not implemented. We just did once. After that, we didn't have any case of infection. We didn't have new patients. So we did the antibody testing. We picked up some additional cases from the antibody screening. So hopefully, we'll be able to repeat that again after some period of time interval. Great. Uh, I encourage the audience to submit their questions through the Q&A tab. I have a few questions. One is you mentioned management of hyperkalemia, and I know that in our experience and those of others, in an effort to try and either avoid or delay dialysis, many nephrologists have been using the novel potassium binders of Altassa and Lokelma. I just wanted to find out in your experience had you seen a significant increase in the use of those binders? Did you use one preferentially over the other? And was there any issue in terms of access or cost of the binders for the uh, patients? Okay. Uh, unfortunately, neither Veltasa nor Lokalma are available in our formulary, but patients who utilize outside pharmacy, we have been sending for, you know, uh, Pateromer, so, which was helpful, 
compared to CAFLID, our main concern is about colonic necrosis. And moreover, randomized and prospective studies were done on both these novel agents. We have been trying to get, get sodium zirconium you know, cyclosilicate meaning for the dialysis patients. We don't have an overwhelming number of difficult to control potassium in the dialysis population. However, few are existing since recently it got approved. Uh, we have been requesting the hospital to get into the formulary. But our sister facilities uh, sharing their experiences, they have a positive experience by utilizing those novel medications. Okay. Um, another question has to do with removing patients from isolation. And yeah. so um, I know that you use two nasopharyngeal swabs that are negative at least 24 hours apart. Um, I have patients at Fresenius and DeVita clinics. I know for a fact that Fresenius has pretty much the same policy. And when I've discussed this with my infectious disease colleagues, at least this is what happens on the inpatient setting when a patient is now 10 days past their first SARS-CoV-2 positive test. They're taken off isolation on the inpatient side. Um, has there been any discussion about using a time-based um, way of removing them from isolation, or are you still using two negative NP swabs 24 hours apart? We followed the CDC guidelines, and we did discuss with our infectious disease also. As per CDC, they offer either strategy symptom or test-based. We prefer test-based is the best way of objectively proving it. So we followed that. Problem is when we transferred our patients temporarily, we took them back in a month. We wanted to make sure before re-enrolling that tests have to be done and have to be negative before we you know, enroll them back. So that's why we said minimum 24, but the interval could be longer, ideally speaking, if even 48 hours or more, but the minimum should be more than 24. Most of them on average got it done within the same week, two tests, two to three days. They're depending on, they go to the center where they have to be tested, then we accepted them. But for a negative patients only, I was curious, it's not a recommendation, but we were concerned during the transfer in one month because of asymptomatic transmission, we wanted to screen our patients before we took them back. All of them were screened before we transferred them out. So when we are taking them back, we wanted to recheck them in case if asymptomatic infection had occurred, then we were prepared to dialyze them in a different area, not blindly, you know, involving uh, with, uh, mixing with the rest of the pool. In the inpatient side, depending on because most of them were on the ventilator setting and in the floor patients or the one prior to discharge, I think they were all not our patients belonging to the you know other dialysis centers in the community. I don't think as a routine, I, maybe it is up to the center, I'm not um, aware, uh, but some of them were repeated, though, definitely for placement purposes. Not all were able to go home, even if they had to go to a shelter or a nursing home, or subacute rehab center, all of them were retested before they were transferred to the pool. So they were all retested. Okay. The other interest, somebody else mentioned the same question, so I just wanted to make sure that that got addressed. But there's another issue which, with, which I find interesting is how were you able to arrange individual transportation? So this has been an issue, I think, for many of us that we have patients who come from either skilled nursing facilities or extended care facilities, nursing homes. And we've had many of those facilities have significant outbreaks, outbreaks of COVID-19. And I personally have had four patients, two were roommates with the other two, and they all tested positive because they were cohabitating and also sharing transportation. So transportation and ESRD patients is a significant issue. How were you able to arrange for individual transportation of patients? Lucky to be in New York with the Medicaid, including people with the emergency Medicaid. Primarily mode of, I think, social workers are arranged for with the system. You have to fill up the questionnaire. They cannot deny during this period. Primarily by taxi services, individual one-on-one. -on -one except for patients who are in need of ambulance, with a, like a wheelchair, they cannot get in, et cetera, then they were able to arrange um, effectively. I think New York Medicaid literally covers for all of them. So that's why no group transportation at all. 
by yeah. bulk of them or by the individual, like a, a cab service. And uh, CMS also has guidelines. CDC has put in on the website for the transporting vehicles what kind of rules need, need to be followed if you are, you know, uh, transporting the patients. Due to the privacy, we cannot disclose that either. So the positive versus negative. So we just made all the patients, regardless of positive or negative, to be transported individually. And people yes. from nursing home were typically brought by an ambulance in a stretcher. And I don't oh, have much oh. of patients from others. Um, some of them in a group home, like a mentally challenged patient, they bring by the wheelchair their own transportation from the center, wherever they're coming from, just mm -hmm. a single individual only. So Medicaid is good enough. New York State Medicaid is really good enough. I'm not aware in other states what will be the limitations are. Okay. What about um, a question about the telehealth platform that you were using? Were you... What platform did you use for telehealth for your patients, and uh, what sort of challenges did you find arranging telehealth visits with older individuals? Yeah, well, we did not do telehealth for ESRD in the outpatient unit because we are all in a hospital-based unit. Major area we meet is in a chronic unit area to communicate to the nurses regarding inpatient caseload and scheduling, et cetera, so they see our faces. So we did not use the telehealth for our ESRD unit. However, for the clinic, um, mid-March, we only did audio visit to begin with. We didn't have the facility for video visits mm -hmm. then. So we screened all the patients uh, who were in the clinic through the clerical system. They wanted us to decide on what time frame we had to book them for telehealth visit or still some in-person visit when it was resumed Right now, we have mixed services, both in-person visit as well as the televisit. So by screening through a of time by the nephrologist, we determine which patient need to be coming an in-person visit and which person will be okay to conduct the televisit. Then we communicate to the clerks, and then they will book as a televisit. And the video facility just became available other specialties started using, but we haven't yet. We are in the verge of starting them. Again, we have to communicate with the clerical staff and their booking. They have to call ahead the patients. What is their preference, video versus telephone, audio? Then based on that, they book accordingly. Then we arrange for them. We did not resume in full strength yet in our clinic. Uh, in the past, we had four sessions, four half-a-day sessions, uh, at present, only two sessions now, one for in-person due to primarily social distancing. We started the lower number, and every few weeks we are gradually increasing the numbers, in-person visits, and televisits um, is ongoing. And the way we, our experience, we love the televisits, which echoes our impression even with e-consult. We felt when e-consult kicked in, we can eliminate a lot of uh, patients to be seen, and which is you know affecting the waiting time in the clinic. With the e-consult, we improved a lot also. Many of them don't have to come to see us right away. We made the recommendations, <coughs> communicating with the PCP. Uh, so they follow our recommendations of certain labs, for example, proteinuria. We recommend them to be done first, imaging studies to be done. And if the CKD stage is three, we recommend PTH, phosphorus and the, you know, like those studies, including vitamin D level to be drawn. When all are done, then they let us know again the results are available. Then we review the electronic record. Then we decide it's going to be a televisit versus in-person visit. All in all, advanced CKD, especially stage five, uh, we would like to be in-person and some of the stage four to discuss the options of RRT. But interestingly, even stage four, we were able to discuss in the televisit, some of them, because family around. Ours are a predominantly Spanish-speaking population. So in order to come in person, they have to bring the family, exposing them for the infection. <clears throat> Through the televisit, the family was able to engage in that as well. So any questions they ask, so we can clarify the situation. Uh, I think it's pretty impressive. I think I concur with the, what they're experiencing. Uh, both in the U.S. and uh, 
uh, London saying able to significant number can be avoided in person visits. Um, Thank you very much. Of, I think, yeah, the way of managing will be that will be really great because patients, as we see, the no show rate are significantly dropped. With the televisits at the ease of at your own home, you avoid coming, you know, transporting and waiting area also a lot of wait time. They have to wait for one patient to be done before the, you know, we can see the other. Uh, many improvements have been seen with that. And video visit will be good because I understand um, uh, in-person visit payment is similar to that for the video visits. We do not know how long that will be lasting, but I think that's a great advantage also. From your own place, you don't need to worry about it, and we can conduct them. I think Absolutely. that's the way to go for the future, especially for renal community. I think you know, most of them coming for the lab follow-ups, either potassium or high PTH, we initiate the therapy. So by dictating, the, doing the lab work and we review, then we share the results over the telephone, you can avoid the inpatient visits, many of them. Um, and a question about CRT. So for the machine, for a conventional CRT, we're using a Prismaflex machine or a next stage machine or what we're using in the hospital? Using, uh, we were using Prismaflex. We don't have the next stage here, Prismaflex. And did you run out of uh, Prismasol or Prismasate, or did you have enough? Because you talked about shortages of supplies. Thanks to the chair of the Nephrology Council, then we managed to get the supply through our sister system and in negotiating with the Baxter. We thought we are going to be, as I said, we didn't um, reach that stage of pharmacy preparing for us, but we have cut down the dosing so to save the resources. It's very critical during this COVID-19 crisis. We have to be creative and how to reserve the you know, resources uh, for real purposes, emergency. So we use the mode of 10 hours, so in between two hours for the nurses to set it up, disconnect, and for the another patient. So you can use simultaneously for two patients uh, instead of running continuously 24 hours. So you are able to provide more treatment for the more patients with a lesser dose. And SLED is the way to go. I think we find Tableau is literally, we are uh, we have not done, actually, after Tableau came, not that much of a Prisma or Flux being used. Because Tableau is so convenient, and our ICU nurses, surprisingly, they were doing SLED. They did during this crisis. Now we found it useful. As I said, it came much later part of the crisis, but nevertheless, it gave the opportunity. I'm very, very proud of our critical care staff nurses. Typically, elsewhere, the SLED is done by the dialysis nursing staff, but here most of them were done by the ICU staff. They were used to the Prisma Flex, so this is much simpler to operate for them. And for us, for the physicians, it simplified our order set also electronically under EPIC. Instead of creating a separate CRRT order set, to keep on adjusting, then order disappears after one day or so, which is fixed now. Um, but rather same dialysis order, I don't need to go through special procedure. So same dialyzer, the dialysis state, same order. I don't have to worry about anything else. So we so, really, but this is a loaner only, not for us to keep it forever. So the Tableau is a loaner. Is it part of a clinical study? You know, well, no, not as a part of the study because the CMS questionnaire, all of us were requ required to complete one day uh, survey questionnaire. What is our caseload? What was it before? What is our equipment status? What is the staff status? Based on the survey questionnaire we filled up, we were chosen to be the recipient. Uh, so in New York, the we applied 30 machines and six centers, five machines each got them. So we took some time to do the training. Our major problem was the uh, water supply with the high sediment. So when the machines arrived, when they set it up, we found out the filters were clogging so quickly. Then they found a way of fixing external filter with a cheap cost from the you know regular home depots such as you know external filter for the micron size and they once they fixed it externally we didn't face the issue of clotting the filters. Just the water quality being a high sediment was the biggest issue. But now it has been going for the whole week without any you know uh, interruption. Very good, but. We don't know when we are to return. Approximately six months, that's where they told us that will be coming to end of October. Um, we don't know the situation. It is expensive, but uh, cost saving in the long run, uh, tremendously. CRRT is very, very expensive. And with this tableau, using the same dialyzer and supplies like a, 
IHD, so tremendous saving over the period of time. And then locale. Oh. We don't need a portable RO with a Tableau. So that is another biggest advantage. Nurses love that you don't need to wield two bulky machines to the bedside. It's a much lighter weight to move around, and it has a built-in screen giving stepwise instructions what to do. And so oh. we, we elected as a physicians also, and we really love Tableau, but it's expensive, the cost, but which will pay in the long run. And I thought for the acute part, at least, it's very convenient to move around the equipment. As I said, we always have a bulk of cases showing up in the emergency room. When ICU beds were full, we got to do the dialysis in ED itself. So it became a boon for that purpose also. Well, we'll be excited. We'll be. Any locale and with the creation of the novel way, as I said, 107 rooms, so we can take anywhere we want, including the even with the portable system for seniors. Also, we can wheel them. But as I said, this is just a simpler technology with a, just a single machine, just move, move around. Easy. Excellent. Well, we'll be excited to learn more about your experience with Tableau. And uh, I think we're slowly running out of time. So if there are no more questions, I wanted to thank you very much for this uh, wonderful presentation. Um, Good luck with, uh, I guess, what's happening with COVID since it's not going away anytime soon. Uh, we and... hope the second wave comes. Right now, we're extremely quiet. You know, we, after right. the math, like after math damage, like after the storm was over, it's been extremely quiet. We didn't have any new cases in our unit, as I said. Everything ended in mid-April. After that, we don't have any new positive cases in our dialysis unit. So no. that's a good news. Uh, hopefully, there will not be a second wave, but we all met and we have a surge plan in place. That's what we have to do. In bottom line is we have to choose wisely the patients for the modality, and we have to conserve our resources and be creative. So Absolutely. The three Cs are important. Right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Rossi, and thank you to everybody who was on the webinar this afternoon, and have a great weekend and be safe. Okay, me too. Uh, thank you for having me once again. Oh, thank you both. Yeah, definitely thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Rossi. I just wanted to also um, thank you personally. Thank you, Dr. Singer. Um, thank you, everyone who joined us today. Uh, funding for this educational activity was provided by AstraZeneca. So again, if you have not had a chance to visit the RPA website, please do that. There's great content on there, information and updates on nephrology. So be safe, everyone. Stay well and have a great weekend. Bye for now. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.